This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. So this is a slide of some representative fossils from about 2.8 million to 1.4 uh, million years ago that have been attributed to the genus Homo. And by now, you should have a pretty good idea that we're looking at a morphologically very diverse group of fossils. And there's a lot of discussion about what we make of that diversity. Uh, how many species are represented? Which specimens go in which species? How do we sort this all out? And by the time that we get to um, you know, specimens that we're quite sure are Homo, Homo erectus, uh, it's not really clear how we can trace the ancestry, you know, who, which of these various groups gave rise to Homo erectus. Recently discovered fossils from South Africa uh, have really only kind of um, muddied the waters even more. In 2010, we announced Australopithecus sediba from roughly two million year old deposits at a site called Malapa. And last September, we announced Homo naledi from Rising Star. Unfortunately, uh, the site is currently undated. We're working very, very hard to try to get a date on the material, but we do not yet know uh, where it falls chronologically, and that makes it really, really difficult to understand its evolutionary relationship to other groups. But what's interesting about these two groups is that we now have got four morphological groups um, most of us would call them species, Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, Australopithecus sediba, and now Homo naledi, which all share um, features with later Homo and with Homo erectus. They're all primitive in their own ways. They all share derived features with Homo erectus, but they all have a different mix and match of features. And that's kind of interesting. It, again, it makes it difficult to understand where Homo erectus came from, and that makes it difficult in turn to figure out the evolutionary processes, the adaptive shifts, et cetera, which gave rise to the genus Homo. When we announced Australopithecus sediba, we were really impressed by the number of features that it seemed to share with uh, later Homo and with, with Homo erectus. Um, this is a list of some of the more important features. A lot of these features are adaptively important features. And to us, our preferred interpretation of this was that it, it meant that Sediba had an evolutionary relationship with later Homo. Uh, we thought that Sediba was perhaps the Australopith that had given rise to the genus Homo or a close sister taxon to, to that group. A common refrain from our colleagues in talking about this was that Sediba was in the wrong place at the wrong time to have anything to do with the ancestry of the genus Homo, um, meaning at two million years, it's already, you know, almost a million years later than we're already starting to pick up fossils of, of Homo in East Africa. And secondly, there's sort of a general idea that the origins of the genus Homo occurred in East Africa, and here we've got a fossil species down in Southern Africa. 
So if, in fact, Sediba does not have anything to do with the origins, origins of the genus Homo, then we can write off these lists of shared features as homoplasy, as convergent evolution. Um, and as has already been men mentioned, we know from the fossil record that uh, homoplasy is probably a very, very common occurrence in, in evolutionary biology. So it's, it's probably not unreasonable to think maybe, in fact, Sediba has nothing to do with the origins of Homo, and these are just um, parallel traits that have evolved because they were adapting to similar environments and, and facing similar challenges and experiencing similar selection pressure. There might be another good reason to discount these species from southern Africa from, from the, the bigger picture of the origins of the genus Homo. And that reason is that southern Africa is a center of mammalian endemism. It is a place where unique species, which are only found in southern Africa, tend to crop up. Uh, if you look, for instance, uh, at historically known fauna, like the quaha, unfortunately now extinct, but known uh, in historic times, um, you find this only in South Africa, whereas the plain zebra, virtual zebra, um, extends up and down the eastern um, coast of Africa and over large parts of the continent. Um, over much of Africa, you've got the blue wildebeest. Uh, in South Africa, you've got the black wildebeest. Up in most of Africa, you've got Grant's and Thompson's gazelles. In the same ecological niche in South Africa, you've got the springbok. And the springbok isn't even closely related to uh, Grant's and Thompson's gazelles. So this is a beautiful case of convergence, the kind of thing that we're talking about here. And in fact, there are 90, 90 mammalian species which are known only from within the political boundaries of the Republic of South Africa. So this is clearly a center of mammalian endemism. And the mechanism that probably has, has been driving this over evolutionary time is that as uh, global climate waxes and wanes, as the ice ages come and go, during the cooler, drier periods, uh, it's thought that a grassland savanna belt probably extended from the Ethiopian highlands down to um, the Kalahari Desert and allowed an avenue by which these open country forms, like the ones that you're looking at here, were able to, um, to migrate between geographic regions in Africa. But then during warmer, wetter intervals, uh, forest belts begin to break up that savanna belt. Um, and in fact, the Ituri forest here probably forms a continuous forest with the lowlands of Mozambique, and that isolates smaller populations of these open country forms in South Africa where they diverge. Uh, if that's the case, then perhaps Australopithecus afarensis up here was sort of the pan-African, wider distributed version of an Australopith, and Australopithecus africanus down here was the Southern Africa endemic form of an Australopith, and likewise, maybe Australopithecus sediba and now Homo naledi are just South African endemics that have got very little to do with the origins of the genus Homo and the bigger picture of human evolution. Um, Jonathan Kingdon, in his book, Island Africa, talked about this when he said that uh, these centers of endemism, because unique species crop up there, we tend to think of them as evolutionary scrapyards as places where species originate and then die without issue. So my goal today is to convince you that Southern Africa is not an evolutionary scrapyard, that it in fact is important to the bigger picture of um, biodiversity on the African continent, and also to say that maybe from a Southern African perspective, it might give us a little bit of perspective on where Homo erectus comes from. Um, so I'm gonna begin by talking about these three antelopes. This is the blue wildebeest up here, uh, the eland down here, and the impala here. Based on morphological evidence in the case of the impala and molecular evidence for these two antelopes, it's been argued that in relatively recent evolutionary history, within about the last 200,000 years, um, their East African forms probably experienced extirpation. They uh, went locally extinct in East Africa, and there was a repopulation event from a South African refugium. So these give us three examples of recent African mammals which have spread from Southern Africa back into uh, East Africa and into a broader range in Africa. And the wildebeest in particular is a member of a tribe called the Alcelophenes, and um, the fossil evidence suggests that the Alcelophenes are themselves a South African endemic, uh, which originated about seven million years ago, and which now has a distribution over much of Africa. 
Uh, the Quaha is also another really interesting example. In the early days, uh, well, for most of the time that we've known about the Quaha, it was put into its own species, Equus Quaha, and considered to be a different species from the plain zebra, Equus burchelli. Um, plains uh, zebras are distributed from um, southern to northern Africa as a series of subspecies from um, Birchall zebra down here in the south all the way up to the mainless zebra up here in the northern part of, of Africa. But um, DNA work done on um, museum-preserved skins of the quaha have strongly suggested that it is, in fact, just a subspecies of the plains zebra. Um, so here we've got a southern African endemic, and one which, at least in terms of its pelage, is quite distinct from um, other zebras, which um, uh, is at least part of, of uh, gene flow across the African continent. And then, of course, there's baboons. Cliff Jolly has long argued that baboons make sort of a good model for understanding human evolution. And um, both molecular and fossil data suggest that uh, modern baboons of the genus Papio originated in southern Africa, probably some, like something from Papio and uh, excuse me, Angusticeps or Papio Izadi or something like that. And they expanded up the, the Savannah Corridor um, and expanded into the Ethiopian highlands and across the north of the Aturi Forest all the way to West Africa. And then later, as the climate got warmer and wetter, that those forest belts broke up, these groups became isolated, and they, they diverged into the, the five species of Papio that we recognize today. Not everybody recognizes them as species, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So here's another example of a possible South African endemic, which uh, is now found with a widespread distribution across Southern Africa. But what about the diversity? that we see in the early Homo fossil record. The, the diversity is important because we've got to figure out what it means. Does that mean that we're looking at different species? And in fact, this specimen right here is kind of very important to the argument. This is a maxilla, uh, which dates to about 1.44 million years old and is morphologically very similar to specimens which have been put into Homo habilis. And there are some people who have suggested because we're finding this morphological diversity early in time, like at 1.9 million and closer to 1.4 million, that these groups remained morphologically distinct for long periods of time, for a half a million years. And that suggests to some people that they were good biological species, that they were not exchanging genes um, uh, across species boundaries. And that has big implications for uh, the nature of competition and the nature of the evolution of adaptive traits in early Homo. Well, again, if we go back to some of these um, Southern African endemics, I think they give us a little bit of a perspective on this. So uh, if we, again, look at the Quaha, what's interesting is that uh, in a study done by uh, Richard Klein and Kathy Cruz Uribe back in 1999, they showed that the skulls of uh, the Quaha is as distinct from the skull of the plain zebra, and remember these two are considered now to be uh, subspecies of the same species, as the plain zebra is from the Cape Mountain zebra. We know from genetic evidence that the Cape Mountain zebra and the plain zebra probably diverged from one another close to three million years ago. So this is a case where despite being um, connected by gene flow, these two morphological groups uh, have remained distinct, probably helped out uh, a bit by isolation by distance, a bit by um, some patterns of, uh, or some uh, repeated periods of allopatry where they got separated into um, uh, geographically distinct populations. But a single species which is remaining morphologically distinct over a period of time. And again, if we go back to the baboons, th they present a really interesting case. Uh, some work that was done on um, mitochondrial variation in the, the five baboon species found that uh, the mitochondrial genomes sorted into um, haplogroups, but that there was not good phylogeographic structure to the haplogroups, um, that they were a bit of a mess and that you got you know, some yellow baboons mixed in with olive baboons and uh, these um, Anubis baboons in the middle of these olive baboons, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, the geneticists, and there have been a number of, of studies, both on, both on nuclear DNA and on mitochondrial DNA, which comes to the same conclusion, um, baboon genetics are a mess because they appear to have a history of hybridization and introgression of genes passing between species boundaries. And a lot of people would prefer to put these five baboons into a single species because they do, in fact, interbreed quite freely where they meet at hybrid zones. Uh, other people prefer to consider them a super species with five distinct groups. So this looks like an, a, a good example of a reticulate species of some organisms which dispersed across geographic space, became more or less isolated, diverged in their morphology, um, their pelage, their behavior, et cetera, and then came back together before that reproductive isolation was complete. We know on average for large-bodied mammals, excluding some kind of accident like uh, the thialic acid that Pascal was talking about, we know that it, on average it takes about five million years for large-bodied mammalian species to really become reproductively isolated from one another. So, um, but what's great about these baboons, oh, before I say what's great about them, there's a second thing that's great about them, and that is um, the olive baboon. I think he's the coolest baboon going because the genetic evidence suggests that first off, the olive baboons originated as a hybrid species in the contact zone between the Hamadryas baboons up here and the yellow baboons here. And that they uh, were sort of almost like a super baboon. They were adaptively um, uh, very competent and their range expanded across the northern part of Africa. And they probably um, swallowed up smaller pockets of baboons across that range. And they, they basically, through interbreeding with them, were able to capture some of the genetic variation and possibly adaptive traits from those local populations of the baboons. Um, so that's really cool. But the other thing is that we're looking at here at a species which over two million years has had a, a history of maybe diverging for a while and then coming back together and exchanging genes. Um, yet their cranial morphology remains diagnosable. Uh, to somebody like Stephen Frost, he can tell you if you give him an isolated um, uh, baboon skull, whether he's looking at an olive baboon or a chakma baboon or yellow or anubis. And so my point here is that the morphological diversity that we see in the early Homo record, I do not think we can take that as evidence of reproductive isolation. Um, it's interesting, and it's interesting that it's persisting for a long time, but I don't think that we can take it as evidence of reproductive isolation. This is uh, some work that was done by Maislin and colleagues, published a couple years ago, and um, they were pointing out that in East Africa you, you have these um, events which are dri driven by global climatic events where the lakes in the uh, African Rift Valley filled up and got very deep, and they're indicated by these blue bars here, which are passing across. And they noted that um, after one of these events, we often pick up um, more diversity in the hominin fossil record. And so these are hominin species over here on the, um, the right-hand side. And this suggests to me that early hominins were probably relatively stenotopic, meaning they had narrow habitat preferences. They were likely uh, savanna adapted, and when savanna belts broke up during wetter conditions, when these lakes were filling up, they became relatively isolated. And then after those events, we pick up new species because we're recognizing new diversity in the fossil record. Um, but I don't think Homo erectus is stenotopic. I mean, Homo erectus, we pick them up in the Republic of Georgia, um, and very quickly after that, they're expanding into um, the far reaches of Asia and that kind of thing. And it makes me wonder if Homo erectus is, is sort of analogous to the olive baboon, like a super hominid. It originates out of one of these groups, and maybe just because it struck on some sort of um, adaptive strategy, which gave it a wider habitat tolerance, it spread more, and it encountered other groups and interbred with them, and maybe absorbed some of the adaptive features. And if this is the case, then these, these groups out here, which we consider separate species, and I, I still prefer to do that, although, again, I argue it doesn't mean that they're reproductively isolated, um, this is why we might be seeing a pattern where they all share different features with Homo erectus, um, and we may not, in fact, ever be able to identify a single ancestor of Homo erectus. And I think 
the challenge before us is to begin to imagine new models. How do we deal with reticulate species? Um, Dan Lieberman has even talked about how we don't really even have any methods for recognizing hybridization, even in F1 generations, in the, in the direct hybrids. Um, and so I think this is the challenge for us, is, is to sort of figure out um, how we might be able to um, develop and test these models. Thank you very much.